I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time to for over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finlayvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you wanna be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. Today's vibe is gonna be completely different. We're gonna go to so many different places. It's amazing because I, I was talking to this young lady before we actually started recording and uh, she asked me, she said, what is your audience? And I want to thank everyone out there that's listening, that's watching, and that has been supporting the podcast to get us in the top 1% globally of all podcasts. Because here it goes, 50% of you are women, 50% of you are men. From the age of 14 to the age of 60, we're 25, 25, 25 in those demographics. So it's amazing because everyone told me that it wasn't possible. You had to choose a niche and then you had to stick in that niche. And you know what? I found my niche was people. So I want to thank every single one of you out there for, uh, for uh, supporting the show. And also, I want to thank our sponsors, Finley Volvo Cars of Las Vegas, Jim DiGiulio, the greatest place, honestly, for me to buy a car because I bought cars from that man for years and years and years, but it's not about the car that I buy. It's not about the price that I get. It's the service and the person behind it. And that's what he taught me. It was the difference between a transaction and a relationship. A transaction happens one, two, three times, and a relationship lasts for a lifetime. And that's why I believe that Finley Volvo uh, Cars of Las Vegas is the only choice uh, when it comes to buying cars. And also Mr. Chris Nagel. Mr. Chris Nagel, I believe, is not only changing the way that people think about money, but he's changing the way that families deal with money and having generational change. And he is an absolutely phenomenal human being. Uh, so uh, that now that we got all the uh, sponsors out of the way and we love every one of you, the real champ is here. And I've been waiting. I've been so excited about this because I got a chance to meet this young lady in Utah. I heard about her before that, but I got to meet her face to face in Utah in one of my friend's backyards when he was having a concert. And I, 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 I thanked her for her husband, but I also uh, looked at her husband and I said, you are a lucky man. You probably wake up grateful every single day because you get to see that face. And in, even on top of that, this young lady uh, started on Wall Street, uh, was, a, was a, an incredible uh, financial mind, has her finance degree in that, worked with uh, Credit Suisse uh, uh, Assets, uh, Asset Management, I believe it's, uh, it's called, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, but she chose, after 9-11, to go into the health and fitness space because she started to see that, that people were creating disease in their, uh, in their lives, and she started to uncover the answer and we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about the rain barrel effect today and the vibe guys is going to change from one side of the financial side to the other side of health um, but miss uh, a health coach i think that she said a jack of all trades i don't think so i just think that she is the ruler of paul that's what i'm going to say and uh, so please welcome to the show miss uh, mrs tina cardall 
Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. Such a treat. <laughs> well, let's let's jump right in. So you you start out on Wall Street, right? Finance degree. Um, I mean, when you think of health and fitness, I don't think Wall Street and the most healthy people in the world. I think, I mean, we're going after money, which is one side of life. But talk to us about that background and how you got onto Wall Street in the first place. Interesting. I was in college and sort of lost, like most college students. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I want to study? And I had no idea. I was thinking nursing, but I wasn't really that great in biology or science. And then I thought to myself, well, how can I make the most money? If I'm going to be working, I want to make money. <laughs> Not about what do I love? What is my passion? How am I going to make money? And that's when I decided I'm going to get a finance degree. And so I went for it moved to New York. My first interview, I was looking through the newspaper. This was a few years ago when you still look through the newspaper <laughs> looking for a headhunter. <laughs> and um, I saw an ad. Um, it was a job that I thought I would be really good at that I qualified for with Morgan Stanley. And I went for it and I got the job. And there you go. It was honestly that easy. It was such a blessing, such a blessing. So talk to us about that, uh, the, the environment. When I said that, when I think of Wall Street, we see the movies of Wall Street. Um, I know when they do a movie about things, most of the time it's, it's not true or the people that understand it are like, this is garbage. Has there been any movie, Tina, that you've watched and you're like, oh, wow, that captured it? Well, just like you, I've watched a lot of different Wall Street movies. And when I was working on Wall Street, no, I didn't see any of that. I worked for a very conservative company and, um, you know, every dollar was accounted for. But sure, I mean, I do know of people that were brokers that were heavy hitters going out with the expense accounts, having a good time, taking car services everywhere, you know, going out for thousand dollar dinners, living the living the so-called life that they thought. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it definitely did happen, but the years went on and you, I started seeing less and less of that. So when, when you go, the shift happens 9-11 and, and it's interesting because a lot of times in people's lives, there's a major event, right? And then, wow, I have some realizations. Take us to that place because things are going really well on Wall Street. You're a very successful, hugely successful, and we'll get into... Um, uh, how, how, you, how you, some of the questions you asked your husband before you would continue on in a relationship. We're going to go into that here in a bit, but you're super successful. You're going after it. I mean, uh, that, that kind of alpha mentality, like, Hey, I'm going to make the most money that I possibly can. I'm going talk to us about when you get to that almost kind of turning point or the tipping point for you. Working during the day in finance, I absolutely loved it. You know, it was the grind every single day, working a lot of really late hours, you know, taking a car service home every night. They bought me dinner. But on the weekends and the nights that I could get out of work, say at 5, 6 p.m., I actually started teaching classes at a local gym. So I was doing both. And I look back and I'm like, how on earth did I do both? But I did because I also had an hour commute each way to work and back home and still finance, commuting, teaching classes at night, I did it all. So when I was at work during the day, my coworkers would say to me, Tina, I, why are you here? You're sitting basically in a cube, your head is down, you're working so hard, but obviously your passion, what you are so good at is health and nutrition. You are so passionate about it, why are you here? And that really got me thinking because I was teaching classes at night for fun. It was just a hobby, an outlet. Then I became a personal trainer, again, an outlet just for fun. But then I started getting clients and then I started getting another client and another client and I got really busy. And then September 11th happened. I was in the city working that day. It was literally the scariest day of my life because here we are, we don't know what's going on and what's going to happen next. So finally, things settle. I'm going to funeral after funeral. And of course, I'm sure you can understand, um, I, I had an awakening, right? Things changed for me and I really got to thinking, you know what, I need to really pursue what I love, what God created me to do. This was my passion. So I basically got my February bonus. 
I quit my finance job, which I thought was the craziest thing ever. I mean, who quits Wall Street to become a personal trainer and nutritionist? I did it because I really felt that if I follow my dreams, the success, the money, whatever it was, was going to follow. But really, my motivation was not money. It was my passion because losing so many friends, especially on the 105th floor of the World Trade Center that worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, they were making millions of dollars every year. And you know what? They were gone. So for me, it wasn't about the money. It was about, you know what? I want to live my, my best life and I want to be happy and I want to make a difference. That's what was important to me. So take us to that, that uh, 9-11 time. You said you were in the city during it. I had a couple of friends um, that you know, had told me different stories about it. This was years ago that they had told me about it. Um, but kind of paint the picture for us um, on that morning where you're at, um, what goes through your mind. Um, because I, I, I don't, I mean, we hear the overarching stories, but a lot of times we don't hear the personal stories and the emotions that, that are happening during the actual time. So let's start in that morning. How does the morning start out for you and what is, what is going on? That day is so clear to me. I remember walking to work and I remember looking up at the sky thinking, wow, it is such a beautiful day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It wasn't windy. It was just so calm and peaceful. And I remember just walking into work and getting ready for my day and within just a few minutes you know the the uncertainty the chaos it, it all started and people started to panic and so we all went into different areas for shelter because we didn't know what was going to happen and i wanted to call my mom in cleveland but you know i couldn't there were so many people i wanted to talk to and i couldn't so i was basically by myself and of course scared, frightened. I, I had no idea literally what was going on. I mean, we had a really, really good idea because we had, you know, TV screens so we yeah. could see, but again, the, what was going to happen next? We didn't know. So finally things calmed down a little bit. I was able to talk to family. That was really comforting. They were all in a panic. And at the time I was living in Montclair, New Jersey, so for me to get home was almost impossible because they shut the entire city down. You could not leave your office building. You had to stay put. So they did their due diligence. The day went by and it was probably around 7 p.m. that they made the announcement that people could actually now start leaving and going home, wherever home was. And this was the one time, and I never did it before, that I actually got on the ferry to get over to Jersey. And um, everyone that got on that boat, it was silence. It was almost like a funeral procession. It was so sad. And I remember walking onto the ferry and the authorities were looking at the bottom. They were looking at our feet, at our shoes. And I'm not exactly sure why, but if it was to see if there was any debris or like dust or anything like that, but they were checking something. It was still to me, like I said, it's unknown, but we got on this ferry and we did go past the trade center and you could still see the smoke and everything in the air. And it was just the saddest moment ever. And still, you know, scared because we didn't know anything still could happen at that point. So I finally made it home and we all had a couple days at home. The city was just still in lockdown. And then we finally went back to work. But it was a lot of funerals. It was a lot of, you know, we, I lost a lot of friends, a lot of really dear friends. I mean, could you imagine working for Cantor Fitzgerald and being on the 105th floor and you can't get out of that building? It's, it's just awful. So, Tina, how far were you from from the actual, from ground zero like how, uh, for those of the people that don't know New York and, and have never been to New York. So you're on Wall Street at the time. Are you working with Morgan Stanley at the time? I'm with um, at that time I was with Credit Suisse and I was okay. in Midtown. So really close to Rockefeller Center. Oh, my gosh. And how far is that geographically to give to I people? Like, I would say about two miles. Wow. So it, it's far. It's far. So how do you shift, how, do, how are you able to shift your vibe? I mean, when you experience something like that, like America being attacked, which there, I mean, very few, if anyone, except for maybe the Oklahoma City um, bombing, 
um, maybe, but it's, I, it's not on the scale of that. How do you shift your vibe back into regular life once something like that happens? Slowly, very slowly, because every day I'm going to work, I'm hearing so many different stories. And, you know, every day you, you basically are going to work in mourning. You're sad, you're depressed, you're, you're still anxious and scared and all these feelings. But just like everything in life, you know, this too shall pass. It did pass. It just took a while. So take us to to that point. So you, then you have the tipping point of like, hey, I mean, September 11th happens and February. So this is only a couple of months, about four months, four or five months. And you walk away from the career that, that you, you know, you said, hey, if I'm going to find a, a job I, and I'm going to work, I'm going to make the most money possible. I believe there's four legs to a table, right, in life, which is a personal, professional, spiritual, financial. Yeah. And in your personal life, as far as the health aspect of it, you were going in the financial aspect, you were going. How was the spiritual side, and how was the prof- uh, like the professional, uh, you know, the the professional side for you too at that time? The spiritual side, um, you know, I think for the most part was always on point. I've always put my trust and faith in God. Always, I mean, He created me. He gave me these blue eyes. He gave me, you know, the wrinkles on my forehead. I mean, He created me. So I, I have always had faith that I will get through something. If I'm meant to be somewhere, it's going to happen for me. So I knew that I was being led because, look, I had a passion for health and nutrition and fitness. This, this is in me, you know, and I still I live and breathe this every single day. So I knew that this was something that I needed to pursue. Um, because it was in my blood. And if it's in your blood, I mean, you need to go for it. So I had faith that the outcome short term and long term was going to be amazing. So I guess that's where the professional part comes in now, because I did I went in from day one with my head up high. And I just exuberated confidence. And I gave every class, every client, every health consult that I had, my all. And it kept snowballing and I never had advertised. It was always word of mouth and I was always working a full-time job and I have met the most incredible people. I've helped so many people get their life back, be it their health, be it their weight, um, whatever it is that they were looking to achieve. I've always been able to help people get there from just making small changes in their life that were permanent, right? Instead of just diving in, Let's just take it one step at a time. Let's start incorporating healthier habits because as we all know, if you can have a routine and it's something that's a part of your life, you're going to succeed at it. You're going to 100%. Well, I think it's such a, and I called you a genius earlier, and here's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I feel you're a genius. I, I'll call you a gangster too, and I believe you're a gangster. Um <laughs> But the reason why is because you were an absolute master at what you did on Wall Street. And then when you left that, a lot of times people, when they make these shifts, they, they almost vilify the life that they had before. So they're like, oh, this was so bad. And then I had to go to this. And then they don't use the same principles. You seem to have used the exact same principles that you did in that hard charging, going towards Wall Street. Hey, if I'm going to have a job, I'm going to make the most money. And then you applied it to the health part of it and you embraced your gifts. You embraced your, your, the, the gifts that were given to you as opposed to being like, oh, the financial world, it's so bad now. I just need to go to health. You applied it. How can a person do it? Because this is the holy grail and this is something that you don't find very often. Um, in, in people. Now, let me let me say this to our audience too. If you are watching on Facebook right now, the only way that you're going to be able to get this answer is by going, flipping over to YouTube and subscribing to us. We are actually going to end the stream on Facebook right now before Tina uh, before Tina answers this question and before she goes into the rain barrel effect, which will change your life, change your life. I read a couple, I'm just a few little things on this and the rain barrel effect. You want to tune into this, but the only way that you can get the answer is right now by clicking over to YouTube. So come check us out on YouTube and you'll be able to get the full answer. Um, let me do that. Uh, hold on for one second. There we go. So tell me, how you're able to take this Wall Street mentality 
and then take it into health because a lot of times people think that those two, the health and the finance, they don't, but you have figured out a way to be able to do it. Well, first of all, I'm so passionate about both because yes, I have a finance degree, it's business related, but you know what? I also started my own personal training business. So again, it is a business. I needed to know how to start it. I needed to know how to make the money. I needed to know how to be that business person. So I think the two tie in really well together. And still to this day, I mean, yes, I'm very much 100% into health and fitness, but you know what? I also have the knowledge to be able to manage, you know, say a stock account, a retirement account and all those things and understand asset allocation and equity versus dividends and stocks and bonds and all the things and where is the market. So for me, it's a win-win because I still absolutely love both. Yes, I'm not so much the finance expert anymore because I don't live it and breathe it every day, but it's still in me and I know enough and I feel it's so important to understand business just in general. Well, I think the, the important part of it too, Tina, is that you've applied the same principles because I think a lot of times, again, people look at it as a compartmentalized. I got my health, I've got my, my, my finances. Can you talk to the parallels in principle that transcend whether you're working in your health, whether you're working in your marriage, whether you're working in your finances? What are some of those principles that a person can put in play to be able to help their life out as they move along? Well, just like anything, I feel when you wake up in the day, you when you wake up every morning, you have a choice of how you want your day to flow. You know, one of the first things I have done since I was a little, little girl is I make my bed first thing in the morning. It's something about waking up and starting my day on the right foot, um, being organized and just ready to take on whatever. So I feel everything in life is work everything in life is work but for me i also want to enjoy that journey so i can look at the glass as half empty or i can look at it as half full and i always look at it as half full i want to look at how can i make myself better how can i make someone else's day better how can i be a light to someone you know how can i take this task and make it more efficient so i'm working smarter and not harder um, even with a relationship, right? Relationships have ups and downs and, you know, they, they can go in every direction, but it's just like anything else. It's work. You know, you have to be considerate of the other person. You have to take care of yourself. You have to be healthy because, you know, I love using this analogy also, you know, you get on a plane and before it takes off, what does the flight attendant say? She says, you know what, for some reason, if you need to put this mask on, you're going to put it on your face first before you put it on your child. So I think this is the reality of life. We need to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. If we're healthy and we're in a good mindset and we're thinking clearly, then you're going to be able to give so much more to others. But if you're not in a good place, then that's going to funnel and affect anything and everything around you, especially those that you love. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The um, <clears throat> Dark Side of the Light, Light Chasers by uh, Debbie Ford. She was a friend of mine. She was amazing. Um, her sister was the uh, publicist for Deepak Chopra. And I met them years ago, but I didn't know any of the, like what they did. I just, I, I like people. Um, so I, I just met her. We became friends. And uh, in her book, she talked about uh, a hologram. And, and, and I didn't know this, but in a hologram, um, every little tiny piece of the hologram is the full picture of the hologram. And I didn't know that. And it was amazing because exactly what you're talking about as far as the health part of it or in your life, every little, like the way that you do every little thing is the way that you do every little thing. Does that make sense? And Absolutely. so I want to talk about this rain barrel effect because when I heard it, at, like when I heard it and I, I, I heard it at first, like I heard the first sentence and I was like, okay, rain barrel, I get, you know, okay, collecting rain. I thought of it literal. And then as I started to read and as I, like it explained it to me, I was like, holy cow. Like if people would understand the rain barrel effect, I mean, there's so much, there's so many things that could be solved. Can you, can you break this down? But do me a favor. I have an 11 year old son. His name is Maddox. Awesome kid. Absolutely. I mean, love this kid so much. Love my daughter too. 
Love, I'm just, but we're talking about my son. And Maddox, at 11 years old, if you were to explain the rain barrel effect to Maddox at 11 years old, give it to us. Okay. So I would simply say, imagine a rain barrel, right? So it could be empty or it could be full and overflowing with water. So when you're born, basically your rain barrel is empty, meaning you're born, you're a little baby, you are so healthy, you're happy, you're not thinking about politics, you're not thinking about what's going on in the world, um, you don't have any silver amalgam fillings in your mouth, um, you haven't taken you know, three rounds of antibiotics, which have destroyed some of the microbiome in your gut. Like you are just this happy, vibrant little baby for the most part, right? But then as you grow older, you're getting older, all of a sudden now this rain barrel slowly starts to accumulate water. But the water is basically a reflection of your health, meaning you were born, it was empty, you were very healthy. But now all of a sudden, like I said, you got the amalgam fillings, the silver fillings in your mouth that we know create so many issues and problems, health issues. Now your rain barrel is getting a little fuller. Now you're taking a round of antibiotics because you have an ear infection, but you're not supporting the friendly, good bacteria in your gut. Now your rain barrel is getting a, a little fuller again. Now you're eating a lot of really high sugar processed foods. Now, you know, and the list goes on and on. But as you're getting older, your rain barrel is filling up. Now, all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you're 40 years old and you have all of these symptoms. You have anxiety, you have eczema, you have hormonal imbalances, um, your nails are really brittle, you're constantly gassy and bloating. Um, you can't lose any weight if your life depended on it. Even if you eat the minimum amount of calories for the day, you're doing keto, you're running an hour a day, you're doing all of these things. The reason why is because your rain barrel now is overflowing with water. It's overflowing with disease. It's overflowing with ailments and symptoms. So guess what? You can empty your rain barrel. Just like you filled it up, you have the power to empty it. So what do you do? You get off of the Coca-Cola. You stop eating the processed foods and you start eating foods like broccoli and cauliflower and chicken and more wholesome foods that are one ingredient foods, okay? You start taking probiotics to support your digestive system and the good healthy bacteria in your gut. You go and you get your hormones tested and you find out where your hormonal imbalances are and you support them. So there are so many things that you can do from a simple detox to if you have exposure to mold in your body. So many people are walking around with mold because they live in a moldy house. So many people, their basements are so moldy, that's contributing to the rain barrel, right? But if you get rid of the mold in your house, now the rain barrel is getting lower and lower and lower. So it's about getting rid of parasites. It's, a, it's about getting rid of that Lyme disease that you caught, the mold, um, just eating, as I've said and emphasized, it's so important, a clean, healthy diet because you truly are what you eat. You really, really are. I tell people all the time, you can enjoy healthy sweets, but why not make them with wholesome ingredients like coconut flour, almond flour, coconut sugar, good, pasture-raised eggs, good grass-fed butter. So there are options. So it's all a matter of just now emptying the rain barrel because I know personally so many people, their rain barrel was overflowing. They had anything and everything wrong with them. I mean, I'm talking heavy duty things that really were impacting their life. And they started to empty that rain barrel and now they are healthy as ever, and they have their life back 100%. So it's amazing because when I talked about the hologram part of it, um, when you look at your finance life and then you look at this health life, 
I feel the same thing. Like you, you know, when you said, if I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get paid the most possible. Then when you go into the health part of it, you're like, I'm going to, I want to be the best at this. I'm going to go at it and I'm going to study it. I'm going to understand it. How does a parent create a Tina? So let's go back to little Tina because to see this, this focused, it's super intelligent, um, amazing woman that really wants to make an impact and is, you know, has found where her passion is. Let's talk about your upbringing because I'm always interested in this and I want you to maybe answer the question for me is, is this stuff made or is it who you were born? I think a lot of both actually, you know, I was born up, born in Cleveland, Ohio to two immigrant parents. They came from Slovenia Slovenia is former Yugoslavia. It is a beautiful, tiny little country, only 2 million people. It's between Austria, Italy, Hungary, and Croatia, right there on the Adriatic coast. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous country. So my parents came, they came with nothing. They worked really hard. They didn't speak one word of English. So, um, You know, that was pretty much my upbringing, but I grew up going to a private Catholic high school. We wore uniforms, we had nuns. It was very structured. So structure was always (laughs) in me because, you know, of my parents and then the way I went to school and then working on Wall Street, you know, Morgan Stanley, um, you know, one tiny little mistake. I mean, they're ready to can you. I mean, you have got to be on. You can't mess up one single number. And I get it for good reason. We're talking about people that, you know, are investing millions and millions of dollars. Then I become a personal trainer, passionate about my health, moved to California. I work for Pastor Rick Warren. Uh, he wrote that book called The Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> Um, that that yeah. book, oh, that, that little book, Purpose Driven Life. Okay, go, go. Yeah, so he's got, what, over 40,000 members that belong to that church. I got plugged into that church for many, many years. I got on staff. I started doing all these global mission trips, working with the women in the slums in India, um, doing microfinancing with them. I, was, I went to Thailand, pulling girls out of sex trafficking. I went to Sri Lanka, um, working in an orphanage. And then I started the Daniel plan with Pastor Rick Warren, and then Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Daniel Amen, and Dr. Oz from the Dr. Oz show. So here I was in the middle of this. They were like, Tina, we need to bring you on board because you live and breathe this every day. You understand the Daniel plan. So I was helping a congregation of over 40,000 people lose weight and make changes in their life from the mental part of it, the spiritual, the professional, the all of it, like you had just mentioned, Kelly. And so, um, so here I was doing all of these things and it's just been in my blood. And so, yes, I feel I was brought up like this, but then on the other hand, God created me like this. And every single one of these events these doors opened up so easily for me. Like I told you, my, my first job, right. With Morgan Stanley, I I applied, boom, I got it. You know, here I am at Saddleback. (laughs) I got a job. This happened, that happened. It was all happening so quickly and easily for me. So I'm still like that. I welcome wherever I'm supposed to be. So about how, like, let's talk, go back to, again, let's go back to young Tina, because a lot of times, people, you know, uh, immigrant family, whenever you look at immigrant family, and then you look at the kids of immigrant families, you look at, I mean, the Gary V's of the world, um, you look at kids who grew up in that, they have the tendency to succeed at a crazy rate. And when I say succeed, it just means that they, they take advantage of things. What, what was the difference in mentality? Because I mean, here's, here's my viewpoint, and I could be completely wrong. Every time that I've seen an immigrant family or a person come from something, like I was telling my daughter this morning, I was uh, I got to do her hair this morning, which is a huge thing because she's 14 years old. And I got to talk with her during it, and she said, why are you so hard on me, Dad? And I said, well, I'm not really hard on you, but my circumstances were different than yours. And I said, Campa, who was my dad, Campa's was a lot different than mine. So he was hard on me, but it's because of his cir- circumstances. So my, my pop... Is, was only 68 when he passed away two year, a year and a half ago. And he didn't have hot running water until he was 14 years old. 
and he had six siblings. They used to have to heat up water on a wood burning stove and then drop it in a bucket. And all the kids had to bathe in the same bucket. And he was almost the youngest. So when I was telling her this, she was like, whoa, I wouldn't bathe in the same water as my brother. And I said, because your circumstances are different. But I was giving her context because my dad, it wasn't like he lived on Little House on the Prairie like he was 100 years old. He was only 68. There was hot running water. They just didn't have it. But can you talk to some of the circumstances that you went through and how your perspective and how your vibe and like your vibe is the way that you really react and project to other people and make pe other people feel. You make everyone feel that they can do it too. But take us into that young Tina that was going through some stuff that you thought was normal that is probably not that normal to us. Well, having two parents that were immigrants, I, I didn't get the I love yous. I didn't get the let's walk down the street and hold your hand. Let's let's talk about college. We never, I never once grew up talking about going to college, let alone where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do with my life? For the most part, it was like, get good grades in school, you know, or you're going to be grounded, eat everything that's on your plate and just be a good kid. And that's all we really want from you. So I think just because my parents, they didn't know any better, that's how I was brought up versus, you know, someone like you having that conversation with your daughter this morning, you know, talking about the past. I didn't have any of that. So I think a lot of it was me just trying to figure out what my next step in life was. And granted, I did have good friends. Um, they were in the same boat as me coming from immigrant parents, but we all figured it out together. And for the most part, you know, we all were successful, but my situation was very different. Very, very different. It's not, you know, your typical American upbringing. I mean, very rarely did my father tell me he loved me. I knew he loved me because he, I could see it in his eyes and he cared for me and did things, but I didn't get the, I love yous mm. hardly ever. So Tina, how did that transfer into relationships as you went forward? Because like I, I noticed with my, my wife, uh, you, you and my wife uh, met in Utah, but you guys are going to become really, really good friends because you're both like, you, you honestly, I mean, I would like to think that my wife and you need Paul and I, but you don't, <laughs> you don't at all. Um, you, you like to have us, but you, you don't need us. And so that you guys connect on that realm. Um, how did the, I mean, cause that's, that's a, a power, a power, a strength. A lot of times people are intimidated by that or they're super attracted to it and then they want to control it in a relationship. So how did that work early on? Well, I get a lot of both. I get a lot of um, people don't want to talk to me because they, I guess they're intimidated by me. I don't know why, but this is what I hear, you know, but then there are people that are like, oh my gosh, like your strength. It's so amazing. I want some of that. So I get a lot of both. I really do. And I have been, it's been like that probably most of my life. And, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think how I could add to that. I I think we all need love. We all want to give love and we want to receive love, of course. And But it's just in my nature. I'm independent. I'm an Enneagram one, you know? I mean, I've got this. I've got nine lives. I'm like a cat, you know? <laughs> Nothing's going to break me down. I'm going to be okay. You know, and that's the tough European in me, right? I'm going to be okay. But you know what? If you really get to know me, you know I am the biggest mush inside. If you say even the slightest little thing, you're going to hurt my feelings. You're probably going to make me cry. <laughs> you really are. So I am sensitive also. I'm just not going to let you see it, you know? So, so uh, Tina, how do you work empathy then? Because th this is tough where, you know, with, with – and I'm not – Whenever I say this to my daughter, I, I didn't grow up like uphill. I did actually drive uphill both ways to school because there's a big mountain in the middle. Um, so I did go uphill both ways to school. I, I did have shoes and it wasn't in the snow. There were some challenges that went on, but I struggled with empathy at times because growing up in a one-bedroom apartment with five people and only having hand-me-downs for my brother 
And, um, you know, being at times where we wanted dinner, but my mom worked 16 hours and we didn't have any money. So we, we scrounged through all the, uh, the, the drawers to find, I think it was probably 58 cents and tacos were nine, 19 cents at the time. And we walked about a mile to be able to get them. And we were so excited about it. And then I'd hear a kid at school complain that he didn't get two cookies and I'd want to punch him in the face. And, and I, I look at that and I struggled with empathy, but you are like, you have this heart, like this heart of giving, you have this heart of empathy. You sit with people when you come from what you did and then accomplish what you did, not only on wall street, but in the health side. And then, oh yeah, I, I worked with this guy. Uh, you know, he happened to write a book, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, purpose driven life. Oh yeah. And here's another one, Tina. Because I called your husband and I was like, hey, can you stop by the hideout? Because I was doing an event. Can you stop by the hideout? He's like, I don't know if I can make it because, you know, on Saturday or I think it was Saturday or Sunday, uh, my wife and I got to be at the Grammys. So (laughs) this is not normal stuff, but how do you have such empathy and how can a person work on that when they, as opposed to for me, a lot of times I I just want to smack someone upside the head and be like, why are you, why are you crying? Like, it's not that bad but you have it. So how can we get it? I think it's easy for me because I look at everyone as I don't know their situation, right? You know, like for instance, I mean, yeah, you're getting to know me, but I mean, you don't really know what my upbringing was like. You don't know what life was like for me. And so that's sort of how I look at everyone. Who am I to judge you? Who am I to give you advice? The only thing I feel I need to do is be there for you, be a great listener and encourage you because I don't know what your upbringing was like. I don't know, you know, did you have a bed to sleep on? Were you sleeping on the ground? Did you have heat and water? There's a lot of people that don't have those things And, you know, we just automatically take for granted that everyone has that. A lot of people don't. They're really struggling. So, you know, there are some, you know, some people, they grew up in a very abused household or maybe the father, you know, was abusing physically their mom. And this created a lot of emotional trauma for them. So for me, I'm not going to judge you just as I don't want you to judge me because I'm going through this life doing the best that I can. Am I doing everything right? Am I perfect? No, not at all. But neither are you. And so that's why I want to just support you, love you and encourage you. Because I think at the end of the day, that's all, that's what we all need. We just need that because if we can give unconditional, people will come out of their shell. They will succeed. They will want to have more out of life. You just, you just need to be that, that person that they can rely on, that they can trust and want to learn from. Tina, there's very few people that you get to see an example of something. So you hear cliches in life, right? You hear these things, but a lot of times you don't get to see people who actually live it. Now, especially today in, in today's society, people, uh, you always hear the scarcity mindset, the abundance mindset. And they're like, if you take on an abundance mindset, then to, you know, you're going to make millions tomorrow and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> now I, I, I understand the principle and the principle is there, but you seem to be living in this and you just said it just a second ago. So when you were saying, when I connected with Rick, right. Or I went to Morgan Stanley, it was like you were for all my UFC uh, people out there. She, she was Nate Diaz. She was like, I ain't surprised MFers. Like I'm not surprised when I went to Morgan Stanley, I wasn't surprised I got a job. And when I went to Rick, uh, Rick uh, Warren, I wasn't surprised you embody that abundance mindset or let's go deeper. The heart set of it, because it's not just in your mind. It's, it's what permeates through you. How can a person start to move towards that and fill their rain barrel with that abundance as opposed to the limited mindset that or heart set that a lot of people have in their rain barrel right now? I think it's really a matter of going inward and avoiding and blocking the negative chatter of others around you, be it a family member, a friend, social media, comparing yourself to someone Um, All of that needs to stop 100%. You need to go inward and you need to really think about who are you? What makes you happy? What excites you? What is something you want to do with your life? What is something that you haven't done yet that you want to work 
towards. When you can really start to focus on yourself and find grace and love for yourself, I think the the possibilities are endless. I think you can have anything and everything that you want in this world, but it's it's a matter of taking the time to go inward. If it's journaling, if it's just going for a walk by yourself in nature, if it's a matter of sitting under an oak tree, you know, if if you need to go take a boxing class and, you know, punch a bag for a while, whatever it is, so that you can get in touch with your emotions, your feelings, and figure out truly what has God created you to do. Because when we're passionate about something, I mean, that there's a reason there. You need to listen to that and move forward with it. Embrace it. Go for it. Be happy about it and confident and don't worry about anyone else. Tina, what do you fear? <laughs> wow. What do I fear? Well, you know, I actually, for the first time in my life, I'm 54 years old. I had a little health scare um, over the last few months. And it chokes me up because I never... I, I really never thought about death and being in the hospital for eight days really scared me and a lot of emotions came up from it and you know more than ever my health is so important to me having strong faith is so important to me but also living my life to the fullest is more important to me now than ever because I don't, I, I never took life for granted before, but I'm definitely not going to do it now. And I just want to love those that I love unconditionally. You know, my mom, like for instance, she's getting older. Every time I get off the phone with her, I mean, my goodbye to her is so intentional because you just never know it could be the last goodbye. And I just want to know that I ended that conversation being present and just loving her unconditionally. So, yeah. <laughs> Tina, Tina, how can a person help themselves to go from, to separate themselves from their accomplishments? Because you have accomplished a ton of things. But the reason why, and I told you this when I first met you, that I was going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life is because of the person that you are, not because of what you've done. When I met your husband, one of the most famous uh, musicians of all time in my generation, I met him as Paul. I didn't care what he did. You don't care what people do. You run in circles that most people are like, holy, you named off like four people just like it was like past the potatoes. You know what I'm saying? How does one separate themselves from their accomplishments and settle into their awesomeness? I've always looked at it this way. We all put our pants on the same way. You know, you're no better than me. I'm no better than you. We all came the same way. We're all going to leave the same way. Sure, someone might have more accomplishments than, than another person. But at the end of the day, you know, our, our time here on earth is limited. We want to enjoy life to the fullest as much as we can. But really what it all comes down to is, you know, we're all the same. We really are. We, we all want to have accomplishments in our lives, whatever they are, they're different, but we all just truly want to be happy. We want to be loved and we want to be nurtured. Tina, people freak out at my friends. And um, for good for good reason, because my friends are people who, I mean, like like yourself, I mean, being being doing the things that you did on Wall Street, doing the things that you do in the health space, doing the things that you do in the faith space, and I mean, being an absolute legend, like being an absolute icon. People are freaked out on this, and and they're always like, oh well, how did you meet Tina? Like, and I'm like, well, I I, I met a guy named Paul. How did you meet Paul? I met a guy named Mark. And how'd you meet Mark? I met a guy named Gary. And like, how did you meet Gary? I met a guy named Robert. Well, how'd you meet Robert? Because I looked at, you know, a woman told me to follow another woman named Jean. But once you start getting in these circles, all these people that I just talked about, like with a first name, 
they're all super iconic, which one guy named John really changed everything for me. And he has two more names, Paul DeJoria, who was the co-founder of Paul Mitchell and the owner of Patron and sold it for 5.4 billion guys. But uh, that, that was 1.4 billion more than George Lucas sold Star Wars. But when I say those things, people get weird about like, oh my gosh, like they freak out on the friends. And, and I say, honestly, like once you start to connect with people, and you start to connect in the circles and you help people to feel safe. Like I always want you to feel safe in my, in my circle and in my, my environment. Your friend circle also is, I mean, if we sat and you named off people, which you wouldn't, I know you wouldn't, but if you sat and you named off, people would freak out and they wonder like, how can I get in those type of circles? What would your answer be to that person that is like, well, if I was able to hang out with those people, my life would change too. But it took you from being an immigrant daughter that didn't have the things that other people had, that maybe didn't have mom and pop saying they loved you every day, but they gave you opportunities. Now you're in those circles. What would you say to that person is like, how can I get in those circles, Tina? It goes back to what I was saying before, as far as following your passion and your dreams. Um, these things sort of, like I told you, just fell in my lap. It's just one thing after another. And I mean, of course, I love being in a room, say, with Dr. Daniel Amen. I mean, he is amazing. He's an educator. I, you know, I'm constantly learning. So for me, that is so inspiring. And I would just say, Follow your dream, follow your focus, keep pushing forward and just let every door that's supposed to open, open up wide for you. And it's a matter of networking. It's a, it's a matter of just keep going and going and going. And if you're in a certain area of like in, in your career, let's say you're in, um, I don't know, you're a boxer, right? You know, you go to this gym, then you go to this gym, and then you go to this match, and you go to that. You're going to start meeting people. And then you get invited to a party, and then someone invites you to a dinner, and then it's somebody's birthday. Next thing you know, this guy shows up, and then this big boxer shows up. I mean, it's just inevitably, it's going to happen. You just need to stay focused, keep enjoying life, enjoy the journey, and let it just keep happening. Let it keep happening. So how does a person fill up their rain barrel when it comes to networking? Because I think a lot of times when a person hears networking, they're like, oh, cool, I'm going in and I'm going to ask everyone for everything, right? When I walk in the door, if I see somebody, I'm asking them for a picture. If I see somebody, I'm asking them for a deal or I'm trying to sell them on this or sell them on that. And then I see the people like yourself and Paul that I'm, I, I was at a concert with you guys. And everyone was like, oh my gosh. And it's in the backyard of Mark's house and everyone's going nuts over the, the performers and want to meet them and stuff. And you guys are sitting off to the side and you're making real relationship. Meanwhile, if anyone would have understood that if they sat and spent time with you two, you could change their lives. Literally, you could change. Like if I spent like spending time with Tina, who wasn't about the fanfare, wasn't about jumping up and down. You were just around there and you were really connecting with people. And I saw you. I watched you when you didn't know I was watching you. And you were connecting. How can a person fill up their rain barrel when it comes to networking? I, I love having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, you know, and I feel a lot of why I do have my network is because when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. I'm looking in your eyes. I'm present. I'm giving you 100%. I'm not looking around the corner, you know, seeing who else is at the party. You know what? It doesn't matter. I can catch up with them later. I'm going to give you my undivided attention. And I, I know that 100%, that's how I've been able to make amazing relationships with people over these years, because that's what we want. We're humans. We want to connect with someone. We want to know that what I'm saying to you, you're listening. You appreciate me. Like you're really interested. And you know what? That fills me up. That makes me happy. That makes me all those things. So it's a matter of just connecting one-on-one -on -one. and over the years, you know, those relationships are going to grow and they're going to continue to bloom. Do you still have pinch me moments? Like I, I had a, I had a pinch me moment the other day. My, my, my favorite team is the Tennessee Titans. You live in Tennessee right now. 
But I've been an Oilers fan. I've been an irrational fan. And even people who are not sports fans, I still explain to them why they should love the Titans. And I got a chance to be able to have, and a lot of my friends, when I told them who it was, they didn't even care. But I don't care because it was for me. But I got a chance to meet Kevin Dyson. Now, a lot of people are like, who is Kevin Dyson? Who is Kevin? Well, he was part of the Music City Miracle. Um, so take that, Buffalo Bills. And he was also a part of the Super Bowl, and he came up a yard short. Two most iconic plays in, in NFL history. But for me, it was a pinch-me moment. And it was a pinch-me moment in the fact that as a six-year-old kid, I dreamed of being able to be friends, not playing on the team, but being friends with the people who played on the team. And I got a chance to do that. And I got a lot of cool friends. Don't get me wrong. But that one, the other day, it was like a pinch me. Like, oh, my God, that was so cool. When's the last, do you still have them? And if so, when was the last one? Wow. I'm trying to think when was the last one. Um, you know, I would probably say we were at the Grammys, and um, there's not one particular artist, but just being on the floor with these incredible musicians, artists, performers, I was pinching myself because I'm like, here I am, a girl from Cleveland, Ohio, like you said, growing up, immigrant family, and I'm at the Grammys and I'm walking that red carpet. That in itself was a pinch me moment. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. So as far, do, as far as artists and things like that, like, because you're around them all the time and you're, you know, you're connecting with them all, you know, and it's, and it's not that they're this huge artist, but are there times where you have like been in a situation and then looked back and been like, damn, you know, Tina, Cleveland, Tina, immigrant Cleveland, Tina would have been flipping out, but I'm just like, nah, I'm good. Um, no, every time I leave, I, I'm still reminiscing and just pinching myself, you know. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I'm sure you've watched the series called The Chosen, and um, Jonathan Rumi, he plays Jesus. And um, I've had the opportunity to meet him twice, but the first time, oh my gosh, I don't know, because it's one of my favorite shows. It really is. And just to meet him, there was this light around him. And I just felt, it, I, I just can't explain. It was, um, it was very, very powerful. So he's not, you know, a Grammy kind of guy. He's, he's the TV Jesus, but he, he has a presence about him that was very, uh, very inviting. It was really exciting to meet him. Tina, I want to go back to something that you said, because you were talking about that, uh, not, I'm paraphrasing you, but you said, all you need is encouragement. And it was amazing to, to hear that because a lot of times people say, no, they need tough love. Like you just got to nail somebody against the wall. And then, and you were like, no, nah, you need encouragement. Can you talk about the power of the encouragement of your parents now? And maybe it's not that them saying exactly that, but they had to have encouraged you that you could do whatever you set your mind to because you're, you're one. I mean, even hearing you like, and I don't want you to, I can't wait for you to watch this back. Your body language changes when you talk about wall street, when you talk about health and fitness, when you talk about helping people, there's this, um, I want to say it in the right way, but there's this posture of a lion and there's a lion because there's no predator for the lion. And even if the lion is surrounded on all sides by all these little jackals or whatever it is, the lion is like, you're about to get it. You're about to get it. And when you watch back, I want you to watch back because your posture goes like, and it's, it, it just changes. And can you talk to the power of encouragement and how that can, can fill the rain barrel? Well, I mean, we all want to be encouraged, absolutely. And I think it's a matter, again, of going just inward and finding out what your true passions are. You know, I had parents, yes, they, they gave me tough love. There's this saying, I, rem I forget how it goes exactly, but it's, it's about, you know what, take your moment, you know, cry, be upset over it. Um, but then, you know what, you got to go back to being gangster. <laughs> and... That's how I feel. I do. I'm not going to neg neglect my feelings. If I need to take a moment, an hour, two hours, and cry like a baby to get it out, I'm going to. Whatever it is, I'm not going to suppress my emotions. But you know what? 
okay, let's be done now and let's be gangster. So let's keep moving forward. I mean, that's who I am. That's how I live my life. And so, it, well, and I, I love this because you, you, I want to go to you, you and Paul meeting, um, because you guys met, you met on a cruise, you, you had had a breakup. You weren't looking for, you weren't out there looking for love. You were going to the Holy land with your mama. And this dude keeps on showing up and showing up. And then you guys connect and about two or three weeks in, you ask him a question. Can you tell, can you share the, the question? The question, this is the great, this is the most gangster question in a relationship I've ever heard. Well, listeners, of course, you know, I have a finance degree, so this is expected from someone like me, right? The lioness. But no, Paul and I, you know, we're, we're dating, things are going great, but before we can continue, you know, I do have to ask a very important question. Um, I need to know what is his FICO score. And <laughs> the reason I ask is because I'm responsible. I don't have debt, no bankruptcy. You know, I have a retirement fund, savings, all of those things. And I just want to make sure that, you know, if we're going to continue moving forward, I, I need to make sure he's not bankrupt, has 20 credit card bills and so forth. So he did great. He had a very high psycho score. And still to today, he laughs at me and he tells people, do you know what she asked me when we just were dating a few weeks? But, you know, you're older, you're, you're moving a little faster in the dating arena instead of taking your good old time. So yeah, it was a very important question. So <laughs> he did great. Tina, I want to take you through some rapid fire things. I'm going to set the tone for it. I set the vibe right off the bat is we're going to run with the mufflers off. You don't have to worry about a person's feelings right now. You don't have to worry about where they're from. You don't have to worry about any type of empathy. What I want to do is the answers to the questions. I want you to, again, run with the mufflers off. I want you to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a question in a certain area and I want it, you to tell me simple solutions. The reason why I say this is because we don't get a chance as, 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 Kelly? yeah. You can edit this, right? I can edit this anything. Yeah. Okay. No, the reason why is I did not charge my laptop and it's saying it's going to die any okay. second. Yeah. I grab my charger. Grab oh my your gosh. charger. That's fine. Okay. You're good. This is Sorry. the way, but I'm, I'm setting the tone for you guys because when, no, no, go, go, go do it. So when right Tina, when Tina is, uh, comes back, she's going to talk to us about how to be able to give high powered advice when she's not limited by the person's upbringing, by their feelings, by their circumstances, by anything. Because I think a lot of times in our lives, we need to have people that will give us unfiltered, actionable items that aren't dealing with just our emotions. And so... Um, Tina, what I, what I, what I want to say to you is my pops used to say this to me is like, can we run with the mufflers off? And I was like, oh damn, I'm about to get it. I'm about to get it. Cause <clears throat> I mean, it, there's simple solutions. A lot of times, like I went to a, a pastor one time, his name is pastor Miles McPherson. So pastor Miles McPherson, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm going to get you. Like, I want you on the podcast. I've asked you for years. I was a part of your congregation and you are phenomenal. One of the best speakers I've ever seen. And I patterned my speaking career after you. So I want you on the podcast, Miles McPherson, Miles McPherson, you can hear me. Okay. But I went to him because I was having a challenge. I was struggling. I was in a relationship. I was struggling. And I sat down with him because my mom said, go to your pastor. And Tina, I went to my pastor and I pulled him aside and he's like, uh, you know, how can I, how can I uh, be of contribution? I said, well, pastor, um, I'm really struggling with my girlfriend. And I told her, uh, told him all the stuff. And he was like, he looked at me and he was like, stop doing that. And then he just walked away. And I was like, well, damn, that was insensitive. But I realized that it was him running with the mufflers off. And he looked at me afterwards. He turned on his way back out. And he was like, I am not a counselor. I'm an evangelist. But stop doing it. And then he just moved on. And I was like, oh. And it was the answer I needed. So you're going to give me running with mufflers off. Top three things, and I'm going to give you a category. I just want you, don't think about the emotion of the person. They didn't not get hugged by their dad or whatever it was. This is just Tina's guide to life. Okay? Here we go. Okay. Finances. Save your money. Whatever your paycheck is, 
give 10% to God, go out and pay your bills, enjoy a nice little meal out, put the rest in the bank. It will grow quickly over time. Spirituality. Trust in God. Put him first in everything that you do. Wake up every morning, pray, give thanks, be grateful for the roof over your head, the bed that you just slept on, the warm water that you have in your sink, the food that you have in your refrigerator, because a lot of people in this world don't have that. Your professional life. Be professional, be honest, be brutally honest, but be kind. How do we differentiate between the two? Between? Brutally honest and kind. Because, I mean, I've never heard someone put those two together. Like, how do you put those two together? Oh, that's easy. Just be honest with your words. Just don't be a jerk about it. Just, you know, use a soft voice. Just have compassion for the other person. And just use gentle, soft words. But be honest. Personal life personal life. Loyalty. That's extremely important to me um, from a friend, for a friend to be loyal to me, as well as me being loyal to them. Um, When you tell me something, it stays between you and I. I don't tell my husband. I don't tell another friend. I am very, very loyal. Marriage. Again, loyalty. (laughs) Fireproof your marriage. That's something that I learned at Saddleback Church, which really resonated with me for years. Fireproofing your marriage. What does that mean? So for instance, um, I'm not going to get into a car alone with another man. If there's a man in the car, there needs to be a third person. Okay. I'm not going to go have coffee alone with someone. I'm not going to have someone alone. Of course, the opposite sex in my in my office, in my car, whatever it is. There's always that third person. So you're always fireproofing your marriage for whatever it is. So those are just a few examples. Health and fitness. Eat wholesome one food ingredients, things that were grown in the ground, things that have not been sprayed with glyphosate, which is basically Roundup, it's weed killer, Um, eat organic foods as much as possible, eliminate processed foods, take the time for yourself to cook because it is so important. In the long run, it's going to pay off in so many ways. How can a person develop their vibe and know what type of vibe to bring into whatever arena? Because the vibe at the Grammys that you bring is different than the vibe that you brought on Wall Street, is different than the vibe that you bring in. Now you use the same principles, but how can a person construct their vibe And how do they know which vibe to bring in? I think with years of experience and just, you know, getting older, years of living on this earth, you you formulate your vibe, you create your vibe, you kind of figure things out. So depending on, you know, where you're at, you're going to know how to vibe, you're going to know how to talk to people. But I think more importantly than anything, you need to go inward, know who you are, create that confidence for yourself. And the more you're confident, you love yourself, you show yourself grace, you're going to be able to walk into any room and handle really any situation. If it's talking to somebody that's taking the trash out, or, you know, it's the president of a company. Who sees Tina's dark side and what does it look like? My dearest friends that I've grown up with since I was a little girl. um, My first friend, Helen, I've been friends with her since I was four years old. Our moms used to take us, you know, swimming together Friday mornings um, at the recreation center. Um, Definitely my husband, my mother, those that I trust those that have been there for me over the years, those that I know I can confide in and are very loyal to me. With the vast amount of knowledge, intellect, compassion, empathy that you have, what do you wish more people would ask you? Because I think a lot of times we have a, a, like we have a gun ready to fire, right? But no one ever asked us to pull the trigger. And so what, question do you wish that more people in the world would ask tina ha ah, that's a really good question um i'm a little stumped i have to say <laughs> what would you i want people to ask me 
You know, what really excites me is always questions about food, health, nutrition, um, self-development, anything to empower that person. It excites me. It's who I am. And I love when people ask me. So ask me more. Ask me whatever. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm, I'm an open book. I'm very transparent. I don't have anything to hide. And I am genuinely looking out for people always. So Tina, I've, I've been very fortunate, like I said before, to have a, a, a ton of really cool friends, obviously you and, or, or one of them. And I've asked them all this question and I always get the exact same answer. And it's crazy because they're all from different arenas. And I, I have founders, CEOs, guys who have exited, exited multiple times, exited for, you know, in the multiple millions, the deca millions, the billions. And I ask them the same exact question, Me, meaning what would it take to get mentorship from someone like you? And everyone says the exact same thing. And here was the answer. A hundred percent of these people, whether they exit, like one of my buddies exited for 32 million, one of my, uh, uh, you know, in the hundreds of millions, um, in the billions. Um, so we covered everything. Um, I've probably had some people exit for like a hundred dollars. Um, that's happened before. <laughs> but when I asked them, what would it take to be able to be mentored by you? They said there would be two things. Number one, that that person asked me questions. And number two, that they came back and told me the results of the application of the answers that I gave them in their life. And I said, okay, cool. So how much would this cost? And all of them said the exact same figure. You know how much it was? Hmm. Zero. They said, I would want no money. So how can a person gain access to a person that has seen what you see to be mentored by a person like you? Honestly, I get approached almost every day. Um, people reach out to me if it's through social media, if it's a neighbor, you know, a text from a friend, whoever it is, and they're always asking me, um, you know, any type of question, whatever it is, it's usually health and food related, but I'm always more than willing and happy to help this person. For me, the only thing that I want and I require is that you follow through. I mean, how many people I have gone out to dinner with and we have talked, they have talked my ear off about what food, nutrition, all the things I'm passionate about. And so they ask me a million questions and then they sit down to order food and they do the complete opposite of what we've talked about. And I have to say, I scratch my head every time. I do get a little annoyed. I do. And I, I feel like you've just wasted my time. Mm. You know, you, you, you made me think that you truly cared. You were passionate and all that, but maybe they just wanted to learn. I don't know. But I mean, if, if you're going to have that really bad cheat meal, I mean, maybe do it at home after I'm gone instead of having it right in front of my face. <laughs> I mean, really, really, I feel like I just wasted all my energy and, and drive for this person by that. I, I felt insulted. I really did. Well, how, how important, and my, my pops taught me this is like, you know, uh, he always said that the price is the price is, and everything else is negotiable. And, and I was like, pow, pop, right? And I found that when people paid for my advice, they had the tendency to listen, right? Mm -hmm. um, when they paid for that thing. But it, it's, it's incredible because you can either pay for it to force you to do it, or I find that when somebody comes to me, I don't care who it is, and with all my friends, when they come to that person and they get advice and they apply it and bring back the answer, a lot of times they don't have to pay for it mm -hmm. because that person wants to give it to some, because the story is more valuable. Like if, if I asked you about, uh, uh, you know, the health and then you told me and then I applied it and I came back and I said, my story is this, Tina, you told me this, that story is worth more than any fee that I could ever pay you. Absolutely. 
How can we help someone to understand that? That's a really good question. Sometimes I scratch my head and I don't know what people are thinking. I think they're on board and then they come back and they do the complete opposite. Although I do feel and I have found from experience when you do things for free, people don't take it as serious. I, I it's, it's something about putting money on the table, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that I want it, I need it or any of that, but they're a lot more serious. It's like when that money is given. So if it's a matter of someone having to do that to be taken more seriously, then I say, go for it, get, get the money, get paid for it because everyone's motivation and inspiration is different. You know, their motivation. I, I don't know sometimes. So Tina, a, a thing that you, that I have noticed throughout our conversation is I, I talk about the Holy grail where you have components, like when you have all the components and, and you seem to have these components, that's amazing because you have a, a financial mind you also work your passion, but a lot of times people that are like, I'm working my passion, they almost repel money. They're like, no, 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 money, I don't need that. And that's the root of all evil and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, I mean, I hear from you. No, I mean, it's a part of what you need to do and it's there. So how can a person bridge that gap? Because I think that there's, there's the polarization. There, the people, there's either the people that do what they're passionate about and, and they just keep doing it and don't understand the financial part or the people who are so focused in on the finances that they don't allow their heart to show. But you show your heart and you're very successful financially. That's the holy grail. How can a person construct that? Well, I think also you have to really know who you are and be confident with what you do. I mean, I am very good at discerning if somebody's going to come to me and they're wasting my time. You know, one thing, like for instance, I'm very passionate about um, back in 2019, I switched over all my toxic personal care products over to clean. Okay. So I have a lot of people, particularly women that come to me and say, you know, I want to start using what you're using because it's non-hormone disrupting. It's non-toxic. It's clean. It's all of those things. So in that regard, it's like, I know that those people are serious, but how many times women will come to me and say, you know what? No, I'm not ready to make that switch yet. I still want to use all of my products. Yes, they're toxic but I spent money on them. So to me, it's like, well, how serious are you about your health? How serious are you about making changes? Because you're waking up in the morning, you're eating organic food, you're exercising, but then the average person puts on at least 400 chemicals onto their bodies before they even leave the house in the morning. And that's even a man, okay? I mean, you're, you're in the hair business, you know. I mean, we're talking shampoo, conditioner, body wash, uh, mouthwash and say some deodorant and toothpaste, 400 chemicals. Your skin is the largest organ of the body. Anything and everything you put on it gets absorbed. So personal care products is a huge part of your health journey. It really is because they cause hormonal imbalances. People have infertility issues because of the products that they're using. So when they come to me and they do want to switch over and I can make really good recommendations for them, um, I know that they're serious. And some of them, they just, they're just not ready. How can a person right now, like when we're talking about that part, let's stay in there for a second. The things that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis, you said the, the personal care, the things like that. What are some things that right now, I mean, Obviously, the, the answer would be to just, you know, clear out your cupboard, clear out your shower, clear out all those things, and then go and make, you know, all the, where can a person start? Because my friend Sean Finnegan said that it, most of the time, the start that stops people because they're not, because they get overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, this whole big thing. Mm -hmm. Tina, where can a person start to, to, to start to put their rain barrel and purify that rain barrel? with outside of just dumping it over right now. And that's the whole thing. You can empty your rain barrel just by cleaning up your products. So yes, it can be very overwhelming. You don't want to throw, maybe you don't want to throw everything out and start from scratch, but what are the big ticket items that you use every day? You know, for instance, your deodorant, it should be aluminum free. It should have no, no fragrance in there. That is a very sensitive, very delicate area with lymph nodes. Um, you don't want to just put anything on your armpits. Okay. So that would be something I would 
would consider your deodorant. Same thing with your cleanser or your moisturizer. Your moisturizer goes onto your face. It sits there all day long. It's getting absorbed into the bloodstream. Why not use something that's non-toxic? Your brain is right there. So many reasons. So I would say the products that you're using every single day, even if it's a chapstick, a lipstick, or a lip gloss, the average lip consumer of any type of product like that consumes five tubes a year. So think about it. You're putting on this toxic, toxic lip gloss and you're licking your lips and you're ingesting it. Now, if I took five tubes of lipstick and I put them into a glass and then I microwave them and it turned into a liquid and I said to you, go ahead and drink this. You would never in a million years drink that cup of lipstick. But what are you doing? Every day you're putting it on and every day you're ingesting it because where is it going? You're licking your lips and it's going into your body. So if it's a chapstick, you know, let, let's get you over to something that's clean and non-toxic that's actually safe for pregnant moms, for nursing moms, for children. Um, there are so many things that are available that are beautiful, high performing, that work, that are going to keep you healthy and keep your rain barrel as empty as possible because that is the goal, especially as we're getting older. We don't want it overflowing because when it's overflowing, that's when you have all these symptoms. That's when you can't sleep, you're irritable and you have all those issues we were talking about at the beginning of the show. But if you just empty it, you don't have those anymore. And what you put on your body is just as important as what you are eating and your exercise, extremely important. How much, like I've heard these stats and I, I always say like 85% of stats are incorrect and made up anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, but a lot of times people, uh, I hear it all the time is like 75% of your fitness is, is your diet. How much truth is there to that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I've done bodybuilding competitions in the past and when I need to get ready for a show, you know, you, you got to really dial in on everything, but people still, you know, as a personal trainer, ask me all the time, how do I get six pack abs? How do I get them? And you know what? Abs are made in the kitchen. That's where they're made. Okay. You can go into a gym and do a million crunches every single day. But if you have this huge layer of fat, skin, covering your abs, you're never going to see them. So what does that mean? It means nutrition. It means diet. And that's in your kitchen. So what are you making? What are you eating? The only way you're going to see those six-pack abs is if you get nice and lean and you, you, know, you get rid of those layers because your abs, they're there. They are there but you just have lots of layers over them. They're being covered. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's unhide them. Let's expose them. So abs are made in the kitchen, 100%. When you were saying layers, it felt like you were talking right to me, Tina. I felt targeted during that time. I felt a little emotional when you, when you said it, but that's just because of uh, my own <laughs> mentality. So uh, what would be, um, give, us the, give us the diet for abs then. The diet for abs. Well, I am definitely not a keto kind of person. I think there's key, there's a time and a place for keto, absolutely. Um, but long term, um, I'm not a huge fan of it because I do believe, you know what, there, you need to eat fruits and vegetables. I mean, how can you go through life never eating fruit again? I mean, really? I don't think, I don't know. That's just my two cents. And I could go into that, but I'm not going to right now. But as far as getting those abs, it's just a matter of leaning out. That's what it is. And you don't need to do a ton of cardio. You know, go out every day, walk those 10,000 steps, eat wholesome foods, you know, in the morning, have some eggs, maybe with some, maybe, maybe make a beautiful omelet in the morning, load it up with some vegetables, put a little salsa on there. That's great for a morning. And then, you know, in the afternoon, 
You don't have to live on a salad diet. No, by no means. You know, make yourself some chicken and some rice. You can have a vegetarian lunch if you wanted. Um, in the afternoon, there are so many yummy little treats that you can have that are made with coconut sugar as opposed to white flour and white sugar. That would be great. Dinner, you know, make yourself a nice steak if you want. Have a red potato with it. Um, Potatoes are healthy carbohydrates. I eat so many of them. Um, I walk every day. I don't do a lot of running or anything like that. And how do I stay lean? It's really in the kitchen. It's what I'm putting into my mouth every day. And I also, I don't drink my calories. I don't do that. You're not going to find me at Starbucks loading up and drinking a six, 700 calorie drink. It, it will not happen. I would rather eat my calories than drink them. Where is the, you talked about cheat meals, things like that. Where is the, uh, for, for Tina, who I, I, I've been in your presence. I'm in your presence right now. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're stunning. You sent me the picture this morning and I was like, tell Paul he's a lucky dude and that he should be praising God uh, right now because uh, sweet baby Jesus brought him a beautiful wife. But what is the, what's the thing that you're like, I, I mean, <sighs> I want to do all, I'd like to be able to have some ads, but I want to eat some ice cream sandwiches. Like I like carnation ice cream sandwiches. What is the thing that Tina is not going to, you know, advertise or endorse, yeah. but is your thing? Okay. Now I am going to tell you, <laughs> this is 100% the truth. I am being transparent. I'm always transparent and there's no exaggeration when it comes to this. Okay. Um, especially if you go to Instagram, you will see so many reels of amazing, healthy, yummy treats that I've made over the years. I have discovered and realized that I can have, let's say, a Starbucks Frappuccino, but I can make my healthy version at home. I can make a Snickers. I, I love Snickers, but you won't find me buying Snickers. I have this amazing recipe that I have created. It tastes just like Snickers. And it is fantastic. I can have pizza at home. If I want to make myself some hot dogs, I can have those, you know, made with all beef, not Oscar Mayer, all processed, every part of the cow in there. I mean, it's just not going to happen because especially as I get older, I realize my health is the most important, especially now after this little health scare that I had. Um, I Food is so important. It is what you, you your health, you are what you eat. So for me, um, I'm not going to go through a Taco Bell drive through It's just not going to happen because you know what? I can buy some Siete, beautiful taco shells, some grass-fed, pasture-raised beef. I can shred up my own lettuce. I can make a beautiful taco that is so delicious and it's so healthy. So there isn't, honestly, there isn't anything where I say, you know what, I need to go out and get that food right now. I have been thinking, and even from brownies to carrot cake, I have been able to create or find, um, especially in LA, they seem to have all the best bakeries. I have, I have a lot of things shipped to me from California, from sourdough breads to carrot cake, brownies, all those things, because I love them. And I don't always have time to make them. So they just ship them to me. I throw them in my freezer. And so I'm eating all these foods. I'm eating all of them from potato chips to churros, all of it. Tina, you're, you're incredible. I, I, the one thing that I'm calling shenanigans on is this snicker bar. And I'm going to have to have one on dry ice shipped to me in California. <laughs> I'm going to get you my address and I am going to eat it on the show. So when I get it, I'm going to eat it on the show and I'm going to let the audience know this tastes just like a Snickers, but better. And it's healthy for me. So that's the challenge that we're going to have. Plus I'm going to get a Snickers from Tina, which I mean, I, my mouth is salivating right now. You said carrot cake, you said churros, you said the beautiful and the way that you describe tacos, I want to make a drive through at your house. Like, can we do that? Can we in Nashville, can I do the, the side of your house? Like just, I'm just want to pull up to the side of the kitchen and be like, you can come inside. I'll, I'll let you come inside. Don't worry. <laughs> you 
have to do a drive by. You can come inside. It's all good. Well, <laughs> Tina, Tina, you have been amazing. And when I when I when I said it earlier that there was going to be a lot of different vibes on the on the podcast, it's it's amazing because this episode was almost four or five different episodes. Because when you talk about the financial side, you talk about the principal side, you talk about, and I want you to watch back on this, Tina, because your posture goes to a whole different level when you start talking about health. When you start talking about health and you start talking about food, it's like, you, I didn't even have to give you the mufflers off. I didn't even have to give you permission. You were like, no, nah, I got this. I got this, Kelly. I'm taking the ball here. Like, you know, so I just, I want to, I want to commend you on it. I want to compliment you also on the consistency because um, I was really hoping you would be like, you know what, I do have carnation, is, uh, you know, uh, ice cream sandwiches too. And I was going to be like, damn, I, I, I could justify. But now you, you, just, you just ruined my snacks, Tina. I, I appreciate that. Um, but it's got me thinking because I'm 47 years old and I need to be around for my kids. I need to be around for my wife. My, that's what my wife keeps saying. She's like, we need you around longer. I started the podcast. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tina. Go, no, go. what I was getting, I'm sorry. I thought you were done there. No, what I wanted to say, especially on Instagram stories, I love going into grocery stores and just making my followers aware of like, okay, here's a bad food you don't want to eat. It's made with seed oils. <laughs> it's going to cause inflammation. And But here is the really yummy, delicious, healthy option. So I'm always educating and finding really yummy foods for people to enjoy because we want to go through life enjoying food. I mean, why not? And it's available. You just have to find it. And I'm here to do the work for you because that's what I do. I'm a kid in a candy store when I go grocery <laughs> shopping. So I'm always doing stories. I love it. Well, we're going to have the link to your Instagram. So you need to make sure and send that to me afterwards. But we're going to have the link to the Instagram. We're going to have a link to the website where you can get in touch with Tina. What I would suggest too, and when I said about earlier about, you know, every single person is, I mean, if you take the advice, a lot of times people are willing to, you know, Get, gather your story. But what I would suggest is invest in it because where you, you know, people always say like, you know, put your money where your mouth is. And when you do, when you invest, you're got skin in the game. And I, I find that you were, you were saying it like people have no, uh, most of the time have very, very little value on something that they got for free. Very, very, very little value. Um, so, we're going to have those, but I started the podcast because of people like Tina, which you guys already see that is an iconic figure in our world in so many different areas. And you very seldom find it in the personal, the professional, the spiritual, and the financial. You'll find it in one area and then the lack in the other. And I'm not saying that she's a perfect being because there's only one of those. He walked the uh, earth 2000 years ago and he wore a robe and some sandals and had 12 friends. Um, so uh, I'm not comparing you on that level and I'm not going to uh, put that kind of weight on you, but I wanted my kids to see iconic figures like yourself, Tina, and I wanted them to see that anything in the world was possible. And Maddox and McKenna are 11 years old and 14 years old. And so now today, they'll have 270 episodes of the most iconic people in the world, giving them advice by name. And what I want them to do is throughout their life, I want them to see that iconic Tina, you could drop the iconic part and just... She's Miss Tina and she works really, really hard and has a phenomenal attitude and brings the type of vibe that she sees fit for the environment wherever she goes. So what advice, Tina, would you have for Maddox at 11 and McKenna at 14? And if you could refer to yourself as Auntie Tina, it would be awesome. Listen to your father. <laughs> <laughs> He's a wise man. He's interviewed a lot of people. He's, he's learning tons, but no, in, in all honesty, um, yes, listen to your parents. They are very wise. They love you. They care for you. They brought you into this earth. Um, they are truly looking out for your well-being. Um, be very selective with your friends. Choose wisely. Put God first in everything that you do. Keep your head down. Don't get distracted by things that long-term will not matter. Can you say both of their names, Maddox and McKenna, and call yourself Auntie Tina? <laughs> Maddox and McKenna. This is Auntie Tina. Listen up and listen hard. I'm telling you, when I, I didn't have a mentor 
someone like your parents, like your father, to constantly remind me of my worth and the potential that I have in this world. So you are blessed, be thankful, and again, listen to them. Tina, you have been absolutely phenomenal. I can't, I can't wait to have you on the show again. I can't wait to come out to, uh, to Nashville, um, to be able to, uh, because I want to experience Tina's drive through. Um, <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be the next business. I'm going to sell Paul on that. I'm gonna be like, look, Paul, we need to put a drive through window in and, uh, well, you know, we'll have people out like Chick-fil-A, they'll be taking your order and then they'll be driving through and they'll be getting yummy, delicious, beautiful. I've never heard of taco be called beautiful before, yes. but I, it makes me want to eat it. And so now I'm on, I, I got, I, I got to start looking at this stuff, Tina. And so now I got to clear out my cupboards. I got to start eating better. And I'm waiting on that Snickers to come to my house. Yes, I will send it to you. And I have a newsletter that I send out that's very informative, talks about so many different things. Again, it's just another great way to educate to just inspire people to be their healthiest versions. And yeah, this is, this is what I want to do. I just want to inspire people and, and educate and pay it forward. So Tina, we're going to put a link to the newsletter in the bio too. So you're going to have the opportunity to be able to do that and get on that newsletter. I mean, uh, it, it, it's unbelievable the amount of value that you bring to this world to, uh, to Tina. And I want to thank you so much. I want to thank all of our sponsors. I want to thank every single one of you out there listening, but please, if you have a friend and I always love this, like I'm asking for a friend, like, how do I be, how do I get abs? I'm just asking for a friend. If you heard anything that Tina talked about through the financial part, through the personal part, through the marriage part, through the health and uh, fitness part, through the diet part that somebody else needs to listen to, Share it with them. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, 84% of the people who check us out ain't subscribed, so smash that button. You know you need to do it, and it makes my, me look cooler in front of my son. Um, I want to I wanna thank all of our sponsors. I want to thank every one of you. Do what you need to do. Um, Tina, you have been absolutely phenomenal today, and I'm excited to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. This was so much fun. <laughs> you're officially off the hot seat.